Hey guys, today we're going to talk about the Megacell Charger once again. I've been using this board for about a month now. I'm going to tell you what I do like about it and what I don't like about it. One of the things I've seen being discussed most often is the accuracy of this charger and how accurate the capacities are being reported as well as the voltage tolerances. Now we all know that this is not a $10,000 charger and these components are manufactured in a way that do have a tolerance, but I want to see how this board is comparing to my old testing method of using the Opus BTC3100s. So far I've tested this large box of cells here and we have this bucket of the rejects. These are low capacity, uh, overheated, things like that. And out here I have this large box that's been sitting for about a week waiting for the voltage loss testing. So the way I'm going to go about testing this is I'm going to take 16 cells and populate this board. I'm going to test them three times and record the capacity of each cell in the spreadsheet. I'm then going to take those same 16 cells and put them over in the Opus chargers, test them three times in there and record the capacities that it reports as well. And then we'll compare the results. Now of course a lot of people are going to be saying, oh well the capacities are going to change after you charge and discharge them a few times. To take care of that point, I'm also going to put 16 cells in the Opus. I'll charge those three times and then put them in the Megacell charger. That way we have 32 cells, 16 of which started in the Opus and 16 of which started in the Megacell charger. So these are going to be our test cells. These are all Samsung 2600 milliamp hour. Uh, model number is ICR18-26, uh, A through F, whatever the last letter of the alphabet means on the cell. So I'm going to go through and label all of these 1 through 32 so we can keep track of which ones are which. Cells 1 through 16 will be placed in the mega charger first. This mega charger is configured to charge to 4.24 volts before it begins the discharge test. Alright, so on the mobile web page I built for my iPad, you can see all 16 cells have begun the initial charging phase and you can see the voltage being reported by the Megacell charger in addition to the charge rate. Um, some of them have begun charging at a faster rate than others. Uh, I'm going to take a guess it's because that these cells had a lower initial voltage than the other cells down here. And over here cells 17 through 32 are going to be going in the Opus chargers first. Uh, I don't know offhand what the Opus charger charges to before it begins the discharge test. I have heard some people say 4.24 or 4.25 as well. Uh, we're going to try to answer that by the end of this test, but at this point, I don't know offhand. Alright, so this next part is going to take a few days to get these tests done, uh, but we'll be back with the results shortly. And I should also note that the test on both the Opus and the Megacell charger is being done at a 1 amp charge and a 1 amp discharge. That way we will have consistent results. All right, I finished running all the tests. I actually ended up doing four tests on each charger in addition to a few supplementary tests, so we have a lot of data to go through. I'm gonna switch over to the laptop now and show you what I found. All right, so here's the massive amount of test data I have hoarded. So as I explained earlier, uh, cells one through 16, I tested initially in the Megacell charger, and cells 17 through 32, I started initially in the Opus. So for each of those 32 cells, I ran four tests, all of the tests were done at 1000 milliamps. Column G you see here is the variance between the tests. That is the high number from tests 1 through 4 minus the low number from tests 1 through 4. And then column H is the average of all four tests. So you can see by looking at the variance, uh, the average amount of variance is fairly similar between the mega cell and the opus. There are a few outliers such as cell 3, 8, and 15. However, if you notice all three of these cells, started around 2000 milliamp hours on the first test. These are 2600 milliamp hour new cells, so I would assume if they're testing this low, the cells are probably near the end of their life, which would account for the amount of variance. And the Opus has the same behavior, so cell 18 here was a 2081 milliamp hour cell, and it had a variance of 147 milliamp hours. So that cell actually degraded in each test. It started at 2081 and it went down to 1934. So then after the four tests, I switched them over into, you know, I switched the two chargers. Again, you'll notice the variance column, the same cells had the same variance. So cell 3 had a high variance in the Opus as well. Um, cell 8 had a high variance and cell 12 had a high variance. The only outlier here is cell 21. It had a variance of 29 milliamp hours in the Opus and 146 milliamp hours in the Mega Cell. I'm not really sure why that is. It looks like the cell degraded on each test, so it started out at 2420, and by the end of the test, it was at 2288. So then column P here is the difference, and that is the difference between the average 
of the first round of tests and the average of the second round of tests. So for cell 1 here, you'll see the average in the opus was 2478 and the average in the mega cell was 2371 and that gave us a difference of 107 with the opus having the higher reading. Cell 2 averaged 2739 in the mega cell and 2733 in the opus. That's only a difference of 6 milliamp hours and the mega cell charger had the higher reading. So I did notice a trend here. The mega cell produced on average higher results when the cell started in the mega cell charger similarly to how the opus produced higher results when the cell started in the opus charger. That brings me to the second point. On sheet 2 here, you'll see I added the average variance of the opus and the average variance of the mega cell. So what I did was I just took the average variance of all 32 calculations for each opus and mega cell charger. Interestingly enough, the opus and the mega cell came out exactly the same, not even a milliamp hour difference. Uh, with an average variance of 60 milliamp hours. I do feel the mega cell is completely accurate when compared to the opus. I know some people criticize the opus saying it tests 10 percent higher than other chargers. I have not personally witnessed that myself but I also do not own any Ludicala or other chargers to compare it to and I do feel confident in the results it's putting out. However, that leads me to one additional point, uh, sheet 3. When I conducted all of these tests, all 32 cells at 8 tests apiece, the mega cell was configured with the software based charging to a maximum of 4.24 volts and what that means is in the mega cell charger if I go into settings this chip control charging box I had that unchecked and both of these were set to 4.24 volts like you see here so that means the charger was using software algorithms I don't know how it determines that I'm sure somebody you know Alex or Martin could probably explain that so that raised some concern because I know several people have pointed out that there have been very inaccurate results coming off of this charger. So I thought, okay, I'll do another set of tests using the chip controlled function. I went into the settings and I had the chip controlled charging box checked, like you see here, and that automatically sets the store and max voltage to 4.2 and it uses the chip which is a which is a standard 4056 and once I change that, you can see how wide the results vary. So the variance here is anywhere from you know, 33, 26 is the lowest I see, all the way up to 318. Um, these numbers are just ridiculous. So I, the four tests I did, test number one, the cells were full when I started the test. Test numbers two and three were started when the cells were about, you know, 3.8, you know, 3.9 volts, right in the middle range. And then test four was a supplementary test where they began with full charge. When using the chip control charging, the numbers this thing puts out are just completely unusable. For example, cell 21, tested at 2387 the first time and then the lowest was 20 was 2087 that's a huge difference because I would use a cell at 2387 but I would not use a cell at 2087 so then interestingly enough column W over here I indicated which cell had the highest result and in all but three of these tests cell number one had the highest result I believe that's the case because the full charge in test number one would have been the charge that completed in test number four over here and that would have charged the cells to 4.24 based on the software algorithm which would allow them to have rested around 4.19 to 4.20 the problem then is on each of these supplementary tests because it was using the chip controlled charging the charging stopped at 4.2 and the cell rested around 4.1 you know sometimes as low as 4.05 and for a device that's supposed to be a test instrument to return the capacity of a cell you bought the device purposely to test you know it should not be skipping the last 0.15 volts of charge even though we can all agree that there's minimal capacity between 4.05 and 4.20 uh, in my opinion the chip controlled charging test is totally useless and there's no way this is producing reliable results so as an example of that once test number four completed I left the cells in the charger and you can see the voltage the cells cut off at so if I sort this by voltage the end voltages range anywhere between 4.06 up to 4.20 what it should be doing is stopping at 4.20 the constant current and then keeping the constant voltage applied until a specific milliamp threshold is reached but the thing too is like it shouldn't be that difficult for the average person to sit down here and set up this charger and get it to test cells. All we wanted to do is test cells and you can see all the kind of stuff I had to do here to figure out how to get proper results out of this charger. I will continue using it because I do like that it allows me to set software controlled charging and specify a charge voltage. If it did not and only allowed the chip controlled charging I definitely would not be using this charger. So that is one thing I do like about the charger. One thing I don't like about the charger is this interface and how clunky it is to use and 
you have to have a good decent background in computers to get this set up and functional um, and several users have proven that already with their frustrations in getting this set up not to mention I don't know why this application requires a license to use the application is free the license is free the endpoints on the hardware are not encrypted so you can go in and just query them yourself with some JSON get and post requests the license on this is totally pointless and kind of irritating in my opinion so one thing that was pointed out to me as I was talking to somebody else about the results is one error in my testing is that the temperatures were not the same with the Megacell charger and the Opus I have the Megacell charger out here in the garage and I have the Opus out in my sunroom neither space is conditioned so they are about the average same temperature but they aren't exact um, I don't think that would have skewed the results but it is important to note that since the point of this test was for consistency purpose so on to a few other things I do not like about the charger I have two of these chargers now because as you know uh, David Paz sent me one of his that he was no longer using and out of two chargers there are four fans and out of four fans, two of the four are already making grinding noises. I'm not sure what the deal is with those because those should be brand new fans, but I'm going to have to go out and see if I can find some replacements already. Another thing I don't really care for for these chargers, like I really like the concept of these two cell holders. They are definitely easier to use than the four cell holders, but the problem I'm experiencing is when you go to remove cells, a lot of times this tab down here is getting caught under the heat shrink under the positive end. And when you go to pull the cell up, it either tears the cell or it sticks down in there. I haven't had one of these cells short out yet, but it does seem like that could be reason for short if this metal tab is going to stick down in there between the shrink and the insulator disc. So if I pull out a couple more, see, like this one here. So you can see here where that tab stuck under the shrink wrap between the insulator and kind of pulled it off a little bit there. So if you're putting the cells in and out several times, it's definitely going to rip your shrinks. One thing I do like about this device is I definitely do like that it has API endpoints I can use. So I can query data, it's just JSON, get and post requests, and then I can post data back to start the tests. Um, so that allows me to run this full feature without having to use that software that they provide. But I realize that's not for the average everyday person who just wants to test cells because you're not going to know programming, you're not going to want to sit there and write programming. But that leads me to something else I don't like about the device, and that is that you can't run the workflow-based capacity testing without a computer turned on all the time. You have to sit here and push this little button to switch between modes and switch between cells and start and stop the tests. It's definitely not easy to use compared to something like the Opus, where you just push a couple buttons to start and stop. Plus, you've got 16 cells, so you got to do that 16 times, one for each cell. And then if you have multiple chargers, that just multiplies per the amount of chargers. Uh, so yeah, that, that's my thoughts on this. I hope this was helpful, especially the comparison of the test results, because I know a lot of us were asking and questioning the consistency of it. If there's anything you think I missed in those tests uh, that may have skewed the results, and I would definitely be interested in hearing about it, and I am fairly confident that this is producing accurate results, at least for my use case, when using the software controlled charging at 4.2 volts. Uh, the results coming out at the chip controlled charging are definitely not consistent or accurate in my opinion. Um, so if you're going to get one of these, definitely keep that in mind, how you're going to set it up and configure it. And maybe there's something I'm doing wrong, and maybe Alex or Martin will see this and reach out and let me know what that is. But I haven't seen any support from them so far beyond a couple of comments to other people about buying a more expensive, you know, $10,000 charger. And that's just not a solution when there's plenty of other four-slot chargers on the market that do not have this problem. So if you're still interested in buying one of these, the initial campaign was canceled and refunded due to... I don't want to say it was problems with PayPal, it was more due to the way they set it up. Um, but they launched a new campaign on Indiegogo. It has already reached its backing threshold of $37,661 as of the point of this video. It looks like you can get a Megacell charger for $134 plus shipping. And with that in mind, I do want to point out that I do not receive a commission on these sales. I am here to point out my experiences only, the positive and the negatives. Yeah, so with that in mind, if you found this helpful, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Any questions or comments, leave them below. Uh, thank you for watching.